everyone. You are in the right place if you are here for 9.connect's presentation on what does a 50 ohm impedance really mean. Today's presentation will be given by Sean Kelly. Sean is a PCB layout expert and consultant in both high-speed PCB design and in RF. He's been in the industry for over 20 years and he's been an instructor on topics of this very nature during his time in the military. And with that, I am pleased to introduce to you Sean Kelly. Hello everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar where we will be discussing a question that has been asked by so many people. What does a 50 ohm impedance really mean? There doesn't seem to be an easy explanation available and most of what I have found seems to overcomplicate the answer. So today, my goal is to help you all gain an understanding of the answer without requiring a PhD. With that, let's get started. It is important to understand that there are many reasons why someone would want to know the answer to this question. A PCB layout designer will want to know three specific aspects of the answer. Maximum power transfer, reflections, and radiation. As far as maximum power transfer goes, we're going to be mostly con uh, worried about signal attenuation, that is the loss, because it directly affects the ability of the receiver to interpret the signal. The lower the received signal amplitude is, the closer it and the noise look like some part of the same signal. This increases errors, known as bit error rates. Basic power transfer theory states that matched impedances are required for maximum power transfer, in other words, at least attenuation. Although we will be predominantly be discussing voltages and currents to describe the behavior, since P equals V times I, the concept of maximum power transfer will fall right into place. For reflections, we're concerned about impedance mismatching causing reflections, which is the basis of a TDR, or a time domain reflectometer. These reflections will interact detrimentally within the main signal. A reflection will have a phase angle that causes distortion of the original signal. In the diagram that you see down here at the bottom, you'll notice that if we have a source of a signal, it creates what we call an incident signal, goes toward the load via the transmission line. Ideally, we want those, all those impedances to be the same. But if the transmission line impedance is not the same as the load impedance, what ends up happening is all of the energy does not go through to the transmitted signal. Some of it is reflected back. In fact, we have an equation over here on the right-hand side that we create a term called gamma, or reflection coefficient. You can see that if the load impedance matches the transmission line impedance, gamma will be zero. If gamma is zero, then visvoir, which is a very common term that most of us know, will be 1, which is ideal. But if the impedances are not matched, then we have a reflected signal. That reflected signal then goes back and interacts with that main signal. For radiation, if the impedance is not matched, and we have a common term here, Z0, which is used for the character's impedance, if it does not equal the load impedance, then there will be increased radiation of signals in the surrounding space. This results typically in increased crosstalk, even possible resonances. It also creates difficulty passing EMI and EMC requirements. So if you've got a product that you have to get tested to meet FCC guidelines, this is one of the things that can help you to uh, pass or will cause you to fail, depending upon how well the transmission line is matched to your load. So what is meant by impedance? The classical approach that everyone is used to seeing is described as the relationship voltage has to current. Simplistically, Z equals V divided by I, commonly referred to as Ohm's law. When one hears 50 ohm impedance, we all know that what really is being referenced is the characteristic impedance. And because characteristic impedance is calculated with inductance and capacitance, we typically dismiss the classical approach or definition. The funny thing is that the classic approach is still valid. 
in order to understand why the relationship between inductance and capacitance is the same as voltage to current, we must talk about an infinite transmission line. In that discussion, time is of the essence. So let's talk about current flow for a minute. So what is current flow? Well, when talking to engineers, they refer to current flow in a positive direction. That is, a positive charge moving from the positive terminal to the negative terminal of the source. This is the more traditional approach. But why did it start this way and why do we keep it? Yeah, there's a little history here for those of you who don't know. So when we first started having people getting interested in electricity, those first people thought that it was a positive charge that was moving through all the conductors. And so all their equations were set up with polarities that fit positive charge moving. Only problem is, that's not the way it works in the atomic world. We now know that it's electrons that move in conductors. When talking to technicians, they often think of current flow in a negative direction. That is, an electron moving from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. It's more intuitive. It's easier to understand. Now, I had an interesting conversation one time in, in my class when I was getting my double E. A very, very smart professor, and he was talking about hole theory and it, the holes traveling. And I, he was an older gentleman, uh, just like I was, and so both of us grew up knowing what vacuum tubes were. And so during the conversation, I asked him, I said, well, if holes are what's moving, then how do you explain how a CRT works? And he said, okay, you're right. Yes, the electrons are moving from the cathode to the plate. And I said, okay, well, I'll just kind of try to understand the whole system. And, and that's when he explained to me that it all had to do with the polarity of the equations. And that's why electrical engineers keep it that way. Anyhow, the following discussion is going to be difficult to understand if we use the engineer's viewpoint. So I will use the concept of electrons moving to explain the main concept essential to answering the lesson's questions. So the first thing we're going to talk about is a transmission line. And for this discussion, we're going to have to agree to some concepts and initial conditions. An infinite transmission line in our discussion is going to refer to one that is much longer than the signal can travel through in a time period discussed and starts at the source. For this discussion, we're going to talk about a very small amount of time right after you apply the voltage. The applied voltage refers to an ideal constant voltage source, and we're not going to worry about the internal impedance right now. Prior to time zero, we'll refer to that as t naught. the source will be off and there's no charge distributed along the line. In other words, all the electrons are equally distributed throughout the copper. So in the diagram down here, where we have delta voltage, delta meaning uh, the difference, that delta voltage prior to time zero is zero volts. Now at time zero, we're going to energize the source and apply the voltage V. Now, the question that I want to ask everybody is when a V gets turned on, do you feel V all the way down the transmission line along the whole length? Some of you may say yes, some of you may say no. It depends on the perspective. Herein lies the problem. At the instance that the voltage is applied, there is a delay as the positive signal line voltage tries to increase to V along the whole line. As we humans normally think of time, the voltage seems to reach V instantly, everywhere along the line. But if we slow down time so that we can see how things behave on the order of picoseconds, we see something altogether different. So what I've drawn here is you can see that on this end of the transmission line, my electrons are equally distributed and you can see that the density of those electrons change as you get closer to the positive terminal and the same thing on the negative terminal. 
Why does this happen? The EMF, or electromotive force driven by the voltage source, is going to cause electrons to move. The positive terminal is going to attract the electrons as a negative terminal will repel them. Because not all the electrons feel the same force at the same instant when the source is applied, there is a delay in the behavior of the electrons along the line. At the positive terminal, any existing electrons are immediately taken in by the source. This lack of electrons makes the wire look positive right there at the terminal. At the same time, at the negative terminal, any existing electrons on the wire nearby will feel a repulsion and will be pushed down the line. This excess of electrons makes the wire look negative right there at the terminal. So let's take a little bit closer look at it. The density of charges below I'm using to try to represent how the voltage is propagating down the line. The less dense electrons equals a greater net positive charge, as a greater density of electrons equals a greater net negative charge. The result is a positive charge, as well as a negative charge, is moving to the right. So what I'm trying to show here is that the current flow is down the line on the negative signal line. And then the electrons are moving back to the left on the positive signal. But because the electrons are moving to the left and they're getting separated, again, this line here looks more positive relative to this line. So this represents a voltage field. So the obvious question at this point is, what does this have to do with time? Again, we're still at T0. Because the electrons are moving, we have to understand how they are behaving in time. The movement of electrons creates a wave-like behavior of the voltage along the line. So now let's take a positive signal line as an example. If we were to freeze time just after you applied the voltage, and you could use a voltmeter to measure the voltage at different points along the line, and what I mean by that is you put the positive lead on the positive signal wire, you put the negative lead on the negative signal wire, so that you have something referenced to each other. The more positive voltage occurs on that part of the line where the forces have been able to reach in that very short time that the uh, applied voltage has been there. And if you took that voltmeter and you actually were able to keep time frozen but move the voltmeter down along this direction, that voltage would decrease. So why does this behavior exist? Why is there a delay? Why the shape of a wave? Conductors have an inductance. An interesting thing is that the inductance is a function of the conductor. So if the conductor does not change shape or material, we can assume that the inductance is going to be consistent along the whole length. So let's talk about what inductance really is. For me, I found that if I relate a conductor's resistance and think of it as how resistance changes with the conductor's shape or material, then I also can have the same relationship with inductance. So whatever happens to the conductor, if the resistance goes up, then the same thing happens with inductance. So let's just take an equation for a straight round conductor, and we're going to ignore mutual inductance. And again, we're dealing with a DC power supply at this point with a step voltage. So frequency is zero. So if we go over here to the right-hand equation, we'll see that x will end up equaling zero if f equals zero. If x equals zero, then what we end up with is t of x will be equal to zero. If t of x equals zero, then this part will drop out. So at that point, you can see that the inductance is mainly controlled by the diameter and the length. 
Now, the interesting thing is for PCB traces, it's very similar. The general rule is the narrower the trace, the higher the inductance. Now, spacing between conductors is going to form a capacitor. Likewise, if neither the spacing nor the material between them change, then the capacitance along the line is consistent. So let's take what is a capacitor. A capacitor is two conductors separated by a dielectric. So we have this diagram on the left that is representing what we have in our opening diagram. Basically two wires forming a transmission line. If you'll notice, the capacitance is a function of epsilon r, which is the dielectric constant, but separating the two conductors. It's also a function of the length and the diameter. So right now, of course, we're talking about air in between the two conductors. The equations for a PCB traces basically follow the same capacitance theory. The general rules are the higher the dielectric constant, the greater the capacitance. The thinner the dielectric material equals the greater the capacitance. And you can see that here epsilon r is in the numerator. And so therefore, as it goes up, then so does the capacitance. So let's take a look at the transmission line in a discrete form. In fact, a transmission line, to properly think about it, is a series of subset inductances and capacitors that are distributed equally per some unit length. So any transmission line can be thought of as a certain amount of Henry's and so many farads per foot. On PCB traces, obviously you want to think of it as per inches or centimeters because circuit boards are obviously usually pretty small. For the sake of this discussion, let section 1 be that first inch or so, and then node uh, section 2 would be the second inch, so forth and so on, all the way down the trace. Now, let's go back to time. It's going to take a certain amount of time in order for node 1 to reach V1. We'll talk about that in a minute. Why? That same amount of time will be needed for node 2 to reach V and etc. all the way down to the end of the, the line. This is known as propagation delay. During this time as the wave moves to the right, and what I mean by that is the voltage moves to the right, the only thing the source sees is a constant current being drawn from it. Because the ratio of L to C is what controls the rate in which the electrons are moving, we have to go back to fundamentals. Current has unit of amperes. One ampere is defined as a current that flows with an electric charge of one coulomb per second. In other words, a specific number of electrons need to flow per unit of time. Therefore, the ratio of L to C ultimately is going to control how many electrons move per unit of time, and that is by definition the current. Since the source is a constant voltage source and the load is being charged, and the load being the line, by a constant current, then with a specific ratio of L to C, we can make the source think it is powering a 50 ohm resistor. So the question is, why did we say in the previous group of slides that L and C controls the rate in which electrons are moving? Well, we have to go back to concepts of what an inductor and capacitor are. Inductors like current to be steady state. They oppose changes in current. Why? Because it takes energy to build or change magnetic fields. Capacitors like voltages to be steady state. It's one of the reasons why I use them as uh, filters. They oppose a change in voltage. Why? Because you have an electric field. The electric field doesn't like to be changed. Okay, so I can hear all the buzz now, but transmission lines are not infinite, so what gives? 
The previous slide shows discrete sections, but in reality they can all be summed to one equivalent circuit like below. Remember I talked about them being per inch or per foot? In either case, I want you to understand that the char characteristic impedance, Z0, is a function of the ratio of total inductance to total capacitance or the ratio of per unit length inductance to per unit length capacitance. Characteristic impedance is not a function of length. Impedance is. Please do not confuse the two. So let's talk about what is characteristic impedance. Characteristic impedance is labeled as Z0 and is defined in the most basic way using this equation over here on the right side. Z0 is equal to the square root of L over C. If we want a Z0 of 50 ohms, we would have to pick an inductor that is 2500 times C. I basically got that because if we're using Z0 as 50, I square it to get 2500 and rearrange the equation. But make sure you have your units at the same magnitude. In other words, if your capacitance is in pico or nano, make sure that your uh, Henry's will then also be in that same range. So, for example, let's say you have a two-conductor cable with a one picofarad per foot capacitance. Then you would want a 25 picohenry or 2.5 nanohenry per foot. Since there are two inductors, you would pick a wire gauge that creates 1.25 nanohenry per foot. So you may be asking, how does all this tie together? So let's take a simple circuit with a short transmission line feeding a resistive load of 50 ohms. We pick the right ratio such that the character's impedance is also 50 ohms. We apply the voltage source and for a very short time the inductance impedes the sudden change in current used in charging of the capacitance. The capacitance starts to charge up to V. I've used little blue arrows to show you that during this initial condition the electrons are trying to move through the bottom L to collect on the bottom plate of this capacitor. The top plate of this capacitor, the electrons are trying to leave it, go through this inductor and go back to the source. As the capacitor charges, the load resistor will start pulling current too. At the point the capacitance is fully charged, the current through the inductance becomes steady. The only device pulling current now is a 50 ohm resistor. Again, the capacitor is full, there's no current going through it, so the resistor is controlling all the current being required of the source. For the source, it always thinks that it's connected to a 50 ohm resistor because the inductors controlled the increase of the current. So think of it this way. As the current in the capacitive leg decreases, the current in the resistive leg increases in direct proportion. Therefore, the source sees only one current value to reach during the transition at T0. So, why is all this important? Great question. We're going to talk about five specific reasons, and we're going to use the same scenario on all of them. So we're, let's pick the situation where the 50 ohm resistor is at the end of a thousand feet of wire. All the while, we're going to neglect the resistance of the wire, of course, because it's not going to change the overall concept of what we're trying to explain. Now, that cable, we're going to say it has a Z0 of only one ohm. When you first apply the voltage source, what current will it try to supply? Well, if we take time into consideration, the beginning of this event makes the source think it has a 1 ohm load attached to it. This provides a very low impedance and therefore it will draw a huge current that will probably overload your source. Reason number two, radiation. Same scenario again. The overload situation also causes a spike of current in the line. 
This will therefore create a spike in the magnetic field strength around the line. The greater the B field strength, the greater the range. Now, once, once you look over here at this middle diagram, this is called a right-hand rule. Some of you may recognize this if you're a double E. Well, engineers are taught right-hand rule because they're taught positive current flow. So the little blue arrow here is showing you the uh, whole theory. But technicians are taught left-hand rules. So the current would be in the d opposite direction. So you would use a left hand to show the direction of the B field. So you can see the B field is created in a circular form around the current carrying conductor. Well, whether it goes circular to the counterclockwise or clockwise isn't in really important for our conversation. But what I want you to understand is the strength of this B field is directly related to this current. In this equation, it shows that. So if we go back to our circuit, you see this blue arrow here. If I have a huge spike in current through that conductor, then that B field can reach out and induce a noise into this uh, wire. We call that induced noise. Again, reason number three is loss. Same scenario. Because in the real world, wire has resistance, we have to be cognizant of the losses. This loss is known as I squared R loss. And since the current goes above the nominal, that excess creates an unnecessary loss of power as heat. Reason number four, overshoot. Again, because of the spike of current in the line, the load will feel the effect of that excessive current in the form of a voltage spike. You see inductors like steady current and oppose changes in current. Therefore, the inductance in the line will try to keep the excessive current going through it constant. After the capacitance is charged, the effect of the load voltage will want to increase it above nominal. This is known as overshoot and has ringing. You can see that over here that as the line charges, and then when it finally gets charged and the resistor takes over, the inductors will cause this overshoot. And then them with the capacitors will cause this ringing. Reason number five, frequency response. So far we've only been talking about DC sources, or a DC source, as it relates to a step voltage. But if we use an AC source, and a complex load impedance, we add another whole set of issues. One of those is frequency response. This would lead us into another whole lesson. Suffice it to say that having Z0 matched to both the source and the load is in vital in many ways. Now, this question that we're talking about needs to be addressed as far as PCB designers go. The 50 ohm line, the 90 ohm line differential, 100 ohm differential, all these are used all the time on circuit boards. So what I want to help you all understand that most of what we just talked about applies to circuit boards. In circuit boards, you can control the characteristic impedance in two different ways. You can adjust the inductance via the trace width and copper thickness. If you'll notice in this typical equation um, operation, you can see that the trace width and the trace height is used in determining the uh, impedance. Also notice that you can adjust the capacitance by affecting the dielectric constant, the thickness of that dielectric, and then the size of the reference plane. Again, all those are part of this equation to come up with impedance of that trace on top of your substrate. But I want you to remember something. Any ground pour can disturb the calculations if too close to the structure. And this, these automated calculators do not take that into consideration when there is a ground pour close.
So the key to optimizing your character's impedance is planning your stack up. Good board houses will help you, but they usually will push you to use what they have in stock. We at 9.connects have a tool called an ICD Stackup Planner. It is a wonderful tool and it has built-in solvers for you. Now, you can use some generic equations that you can get off the web to calculate pretty close what the character's impedance is. But this has a field solver in it and it also takes into consideration the different dielectrics and the fact that you may have uh, different structures because you may have an embedded microstrip. So all that can be done for you in our stack up planner. Notice it's all like completely fully configurable. It deals with all the different, the most common material library. And it doesn't care whether it's a pre prager core, it also includes a solder mask. You know, that's something else that a lot of people don't think about is the solder mask is a dielectric and it will disturb the electric field on those exterior layers. And if you don't take that into consideration, that can be a problem. So I've got a little program here I want to show you. Um, we have at 9.connects the ability to do 3D electromagnetic simulation with a program called HFSS by ANSYS. So I've got a microstrip here I want to show you and I'm going to show you here in this slide you have a substrate, you have a microstrip and then there's a ground plane underneath the substrate and what I've created here in the middle is a sheet in the YZ plane so I can show you the fields on that plate. It's just a cut line. It's an imaginary sheet. It doesn't exist in reality. I'll show you the actual propagation in just a second. But if you'll notice, you can see that as we start on the left hand side, the input port, that the density of the or intensity of the electric field at the input is very high and it's very low on the output. When I start the simulation you'll notice that the intensity of the the high intensity electric field will start moving to the right and it propagates all the way to the output. So at this point I'm going to show you the simulation so you can see it in real time. So again, we have a substrate and we have a microstrip. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the microstrip. I'm sorry, the substrate. So it'll be easier to see. This E field. So what you're looking at right now is if you were looking right through the side of your substrate. Again, the input's on the left and on the right is the output of that microstrip. And I'm going to animate this behavior. So the majority of your electric field is concentrated between the microstrip and the ground plane. Notice there is some electric field radiating outside of the microstrip. So one of the things that you learn when you do field solving is that the reason why you have most of the field inside your dielectric is because of that dielectric constant. It has a tendency to suck in the electric fields and keep them trapped in there. In this simulation, I used a lower frequency to show you more of the field propagating as like our initial example. Now I'll show you what one looks like at a higher frequency. Now 
Now, one of the things we talked about is also reflections. Here's another video that was very interesting to show you how reflections occur and what they do. We're going to start with the input on the left. This is a differential trace that gets driven to a set of vias. Notice how part of the energy is reflected back. Some of the energy keeps on going. So as you're doing your PCB layout, the impedance of those vias can be very detrimental to the ability of your signal to propagate through your board properly. And that concludes today's webinar. I appreciate again your time and hope you found it to be helpful and hope you have a great day. Folks, I'm not sure why you showed up today, but we here at 9.connects know that topics of this nature are important to you. We know they're important for designing the PCB, especially as speeds are increasing, signal integrity issues are becoming more and more prevalent, and the demand for wireless is growing bigger and bigger each day. At 9.connects, this is the knowledge that we sell, and we sell it in different ways. Most of you know that we sell this knowledge in the form of trainings and coachings, especially with Altium Designer, and most recently with our new PCB Fundamentals class. We're also happy to announce that we have just released two one-day classes for Altium Designer libraries and schematics. In addition to coaching and training, we consult. And this word is really abused because anyone can call themselves consultants. So what do we mean by it? It means that if you have any challenges or issues with your PCB design, we can assist you. You have a board that will be handling large amounts of power, we can assist. Have boards that need compliance testing or designed to be compliant to a standard, we can assist. In short, we can assist you in achieving your design. And by the way, we're more than happy to assist in board layout as well. When I was doing design, we had challenges which we call technological hurdles. And I'm sure you deal with them all the time. And in some cases, you may be avoiding features like wireless or gigahertz speed devices because this stuff may seem like major technological hurdles to overcome. But you don't have to wing it or go at it alone or even avoid it. Let us here at 9.connects get you over those technological hurdles. So for more information, contact us and check us out on the web at 9.connects.com. Thank you very much for taking a look at this video and you have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.